Welcome to another session of Chalcedon Q&A, some meat of the word. This is Martin Salbretti, I'm the Vice President of the Chalcedon Foundation, and we're broadcasting live from Georgetown, Texas. We always wait a little bit for our uh, technical staff to uh, get us tied in to the calcedon.edu website, so we're actually simulcasting between Facebook Live and the actual proper Chalcedon website. The advantage of being here on uh, Facebook is that you can ask questions directly, uh, as opposed to on the Chalcedon website, it's not so direct. Also, we remind everyone to go ahead and answer your, or ask questions in advance uh, by writing ask.chalcedon at chalcedon.edu. At that point, we can go ahead and uh, uh, take them and we get to those questions first. Hey, Bill, see that you're in today. Uh, we have a couple of questions uh, that came in this week, so we'll take those first. And then we'll, if there's any pending questions out there, we will dig into those and uh, hopefully have an interesting session here. I'm not uh, sure if Ground Control has us connected yet, but uh, hey, Bill, hello to you too. I wonder what state you're in today. <laughs> Quite the itinerant uh, Reconstructionist, Bill. Uh, as soon as uh, Ground Control tells me that we're connected, uh, then we'll go ahead and uh, move over uh, and start in earnest. Also a reminder, uh, we have a Book of the Month Club coming up in June. And uh, if you haven't signed up for it, Mark Rushton is leading a Book of the Month Club discussion on... Oh, standing by. Good. Ground Control is getting us connected. Uh, we have uh, a, second, not, a, a different uh, team member pulling that off today. Uh, so we'll let uh, him get up to speed, and he'll alert us as soon as we are connected. But again, uh, Book of the Month Club coming up with Mark Rushtuni leading a discussion with uh, Andrea Schwartz on this independent republic. So it should be a, a real barnstormer. I think you're going to enjoy that. Also, um, feel free to um, support us at Calcedon. Uh, our, as Rushtuni would say, uh, our work is limited by uh, what you donate to us. So uh, when the donations are larger, our work expands. When it contracts, then we uh, pull in our horns a little bit and continue to work, move forward. No matter what the pace, that's what God allows through the, the giving of our uh, supporters. And we all appreciate every single one of you all who do that. So let me see if we have a contact yet, and then we'll go ahead and pop into the first question, which is an interesting one on the topic of torture. And um, some of these delays can seem like torture out there, but that's a different story. Uh, and this kind of dovetails a little bit with what I was mentioning last week about the propensity for modern man uh, and his enjoyment of horror films. In the case of horror films, we find that uh, man's imagination and, and the depths of Satan are, are quite deep. The things that we can imagine against uh, our fellow human being uh, uh, and the atrocities that can be con um, inspired and uh, put together, just ast uh, astonishing. Bill tells me he was with uh, Dr. Matt Clark at Foothills Christian Assembly in Edgefield, South Carolina. He's a good man. I'm glad that you're with uh, uh, Matt up there. And hello from uh, uh, Texas to you there, Gwen. And we're getting a uh, uh, hello from Kansas, just to the north of us. Not too far north. Uh, let's see. I am still seeing if Chalcedon's ground control has us connected yet. Zachary, good to have you with us today. Hope you have some questions because we only have two going in. So we'll try to an uh, ask, answer anyone uh, who has anything pending. And once, okay, I'm, I'm not going to pretend to knowing French language. I can order a French fry, I suppose, but that's not the limit of that. All right, ground control is probably busily trying to connect us to the Chalcedon site. Yes? By the way, how many of you folks have seen the new uh, prophecy um, predictions that are coming out in the world of dispensationalism? They are now claiming that Turkey is Gog, and uh, all these videos are being produced to say we're in the end times uh, Ezekiel 38-39 battle. It's imminent now. There's no question in their mind that that's what's going down the pike. So uh, this old canard is coming back to the front burner for the dispensationalists who are adamant that they will not die, that they'll be raptured. 
So that's a, a tragedy. Now, there's two much superior interpretations of that Ezekiel 38-39 battle. Both of them place the battle in ancient history. Uh, Gary DeMar uh, has uh, done a very good service in uh, connecting it to the um, events of Esther. Uh, I think he was successful in doing this, by and large, with Zechariah 12. Uh, I'm not as convinced with his Ezekiel 38-39, but it's only because I think there's a better alternative, in my opinion. In my opinion, Ralph Woodrow uh, and Adam Clark and others were closer to the mark when they believed that the deliverance occurred during the Maccabean War, that it was the Seleucid Empire that was coming in and, and uh, the Syrians, and Gigas, which may have been the Gog of uh, the passage in Ezekiel 30-39, was in fact uh, defeated historically at the conclusion of the Maccabean War, around between 170 and 166 BC, approximately. And it was a miraculous delivery as well, in every respect. Now, what's also interesting is that for those who claim we take the scriptures literally, this is the one area where the dispensationalists seem to fall apart because it says every, shoulders, every sh soldier will be on horseback and they will have a spear in one hand and a buckler in the other and a shield. All these things are implements of ancient warfare. And uh, that is exactly what happened, whether we're talking about an Esther era fulfillment or a Maccabean era fulfillment. Okay, thank you, ground control. So we're good to go. So we advise folks not to go off the deep end with all these uh, oddball interpretations. One of the things that always uh, stunned me is when uh, Hal Lindsey would say, why do we send out special teams to uh, find the corpses to bury them? He says, because they're radioactive. Uh, it's from a nuclear fallout or what have you. All I have to do is point out what happened in the parable of the Good Samaritan. There's the guy in the ditch. Was he radioactive? Sure seemed like it because the Levite and the other guy, the priest, they both walk around him. They keep their distance away. Was it a radi radioactive body? No, they were unwilling to help him, one. And two, uh, if he was a dead body, uh, touching him would make them unfit for temple service. So the reason that in the, the Old Testament era you would send special teams out is those teams would become defiled by contact with the dead body and had nothing to do with the radioactivity of the 20th century. So... I'm going to let to say we're going to see a lot of these things circulating as they try to breathe new life into a dying prophecy model and uh, is only going to accelerate at this point because I think desperation is going to set in as more and more funny things that go counter to their predictions continue to happen. Uh, this was obvious when Hal Lindsey, who has yet to issue a, um, a correction to his original book, the late great planet Earth. In chapter 6 of that book, he predicted war between Egypt and Israel. The very next thing that actually happened was they signed a peace treaty between the two nations, which is still in effect today, decades later. And no correction has been forthcoming. I don't expect one either. I, don't, I think he will um, be gathered to his fathers, not be raptured like he predicted he would be, and uh, learn the hard way that he was propagating error, error and many people were being dragged into uh, his um, er, uh, fallacies. So, if the if you predict war and the next thing that happens is peace, time to look at your theory again. Time to uh, reconnoiter and and get your act together. Seems to me. So I will get to Bill's question. It's the first one on our live list, but I have two questions pending on uh, that came in through the mails. Uh, having read your position paper on national defense in the Bible, along with Dr. Rashtuni's assertion that biblical law provides for only three options in terms of passing sentence on an offender, restitution, capital punishment, corporal punishment, which is limited to no more than 40 lashes, please comment on the biblical position on the torture of captives in order to obtain information to, quote, protect a nation's citizens, unquote, from future planned attacks. And the follow-up question is, does the Bible ever condone the use of torture? And he comments, as far as I can see or tell, we do see instances of torture, but they were pagan in origin, Christ flogging and crucifixion as a way to take a person's life. Um, R.J. Rashtuni has not left us in the um, lurch in respect to the doctrine of torture, the biblical doctrine. In fact, in the newly published uh, In Informed Faith in Volume 2, uh, page 1, 568, which is uh, position paper 130, was well, position paper is number 68, but it's 133rd chapter in the book, is called Justice and Torture. 
And when I was doing the Book of the Month Club a little while ago uh, on the cure of souls, I talked a bit about torture, that confession was gained judicially using torture. Uh, because when you make con human confession, the standard for judge justice instead of evidence, as Rashtuni points out, the confession is the shortcut to justice and to truth, then torture makes sense. And it's always in terms of statism that torture is to be uh, um, generally defended. We, the state has to protect its own and itself, you know, self-perpetuate. Therefore, what the state does is right, and therefore we have a massive revival of torture, and as Rashtuni points out, mass murder at the same time. They're part and parcel. Interestingly enough, for all the attacks on biblical law that it's barbaric, it's humanistic law, status law, that invariably moves to torture, which the Bible forbids. It absolutely forbids it for any purpose or any reason. So the evidence gained by that, uh, um, or the confessions gained, which is really confess where the bomb is or confess where the, the hostages are, these are also forms of confession as my, uh, of a particular sin for a judicial purpose. Uh, they all fall foul of the fact that, in fact, the Scripture gives, gives us no authority to utilize this, and it's by the elevation of confession above its uh, legitimate station, which is quite limited in Scripture, that uh, police authorities around the world go for the shortcut. As Rashtuni says, it's much easier to torture someone rather than do the legwork to get the answer the correct biblical way. Because here the Bible, again, is a restraint on man, on humanistic statist man. And men resent this, and they defend torture uh, vigorously as a necessity. As, as, and so the argument is always raised as a pragmatic one. You know, you're going, if it was your uh, daughter that was being held captive, wouldn't you torture the guy who knows where she is? It's things on this order. So this, um, again, faulty moral calculus, which is anti-biblical and pro-statist, it says that the state's methods are the right methods to use, and you should use them too. Uh, it's uh, an attack on biblical law, and again, it is substituting a much more severe thing, torture, for the far more limited uh, actions that are possible under biblical law. So the, the basic answer to the question is, uh, is Scripture nowhere countenances torture, particularly to acquire information or a confession of any kind. A confession of information is the same thing, tantamount to the same thing. These are n n um, showstoppers from the biblical point of view. And that's significant. Otto Scott would often comment that in the 50s, and even the six into the 60s, the New York Public Library, the big one, it's New York City, he said there was a special section that was cordoned off. You needed a special permission as like a journalist or a scholar or someone doing a doctoral dissertation to be allowed back there in those particular book rows. What was in those book rows? Books about torture, uh, often graphic ones, including imagery. And it was thought that the populace should not be exposed to these things because of the copycat phenomenon. Plus, it's extremely uh, traumatizing to view and understand these things. So this was the province of experts. Uh, who pres presumably, like a doctor could handle seeing a, um, a opened up chest doing a heart surgery, that would be normal for him. That's daily stuff, you know, same old, same old to him. To us, it might be something that would cause us to faint at the sight of blood if we weren't ready for it. We are so numbed to these kind of things that uh, we, in the era of ho horror movies, we invite more, greater and greater atrocities and the more savage and vicious and terrifying and awesomely uh, hideous these things are, the, the bigger the ratings in the, uh, the movie among the horror movie aficionados. I don't see how that is remotely healthy to the soul of a human being. So there was some wisdom in the fact that those books were off limits to the general public. Now they're on the movie screens. <laughs> those exact same phenomena uh, are on the movie screens. Now the difference, of course, with the books in the New York City Library was that they were real. It was not fictional. However, what we usually find out is that the truth is more severe than fiction and that though movie uh, people who write screenplays for horror movies can certainly come up with some horrible things, man in real life can often come up with worse. And that's because, as we've quoted from Ecclesiastes, God made man upright, but men have sought out many devices, many machinations, many deviations from what is righteous and true. So that'd be the upshot of question one. And we certainly invite you to read the essay, Justice and Torture, that Dresh Duny wrote. It's part of An Informed Faith, Volume 2, page 568. It gives a good 
outline. He also touches this topic in, like I mentioned, uh, The Cure of Souls. And he pinpoints when in time the great revivals of torture uh, came back online, like in the 13th century, and now, of course, the 20th century, and why. Uh, Kelly Rains had asked a question. Hello, Mr. Sobretti. Is there such a thing as a Christian denomination or otherwise religious sect which scrupulously worships God the Father but has no knowledge of Christ? Well, pretty much this is what the Unitarians are. The um, Universalist Unitarian Christian Church is exactly this. You know, Ralph Waldo Emerson was of this mindset. Unitarianism goes back and has a long history where they would only be, be radically monotheistic and then Christ is not the second person of the Trinity. The Trinity is explicitly denied, and therefore they have to may play fast and loose with all these passages, say in First John and elsewhere, that are indicative that that is the antichristic spirit. The denial of the incarnation of the second person of the Trinity uh, is in fact an, an, the antichrist, the liar and the deceiver, such a one. Thank you, Ground Control. Now, we definitely have uh, opportunity for people to order up their three-volume set of uh, an informed faith. Now, about the Unitarians, what do you have left when Jesus is no longer the second person of the Trinity? You have nothing but an ethical teacher. You have what Warfield called a Christless Christianity. There is no atonement. Men, therefore, are responsible for self-atonement. And therefore, what the ver once you take away all of Christ's statements related to his deity or his status, and you just turn him into an ethical teacher, you end up with what ultimately becomes political, social, um, justice warrior stuff. In other words, they say what we need to do is uh, do what Jesus said, uh, take care of the poor and visit the people in prison and things like that, which are all in themselves fine. But if that's the sum total of the faith, then you simply have a secular uh, millennium that you're trying to bring online. And this is exactly the mission of the Unitarians. Otto Scott wrote an interesting book, probably one of his best, called The Secret Six. It was about the Unitarian influence on the abolitionist movement uh, prior to and through the Civil War, America's uh, war between the states. And their mission uh, as Unitarians was we're not going to be patient uh, as, as other nations were to get rid of slavery peaceably. We're going to get rid of it with war and because the end justifies the means because you know, Jesus is not on, his th on the throne. We can't appeal to him. We have, uh, and this is where it becomes very interesting to me. You see, in Old Testament Israel, the kings came from Judah, and they had all power, but they were usually very immoral people. The, and that's why I have so few examples of good kings. You, know, you can name them one hand compared to all the bad ones, of which uh, uh, Israel, the northern tribe after the division, all of them were bad, <laughs> in essence, with, with just slight nuances not enough to be really significant. So, Judah is the source of the king's uh, political power, but the ministry of mercy through the priest was through Levi. Now, a priest or a Levite had very little authority. In other words, he had the heart and the mercy, but he had no strength or power to implement his works of mercy. Conversely, the guy who had the power had no sense of mercy. They tended to be like the unjust magistrate of Luke 18, who feared neither God nor man, therefore wouldn't deliver the woman from her oppression, the widow that besought her, uh, besought him for, uh, avenge me of my enemies, relieve me of my oppressor. So that was the way most kings are, very unapproachable, powerful, and only out for themselves. So what happens in Zechariah 6 is there's a union of the two offices of priest and king in Christ alone. And here, what do you have? You have the mercy associated with the power to implement the mercy for the first time. See, he's a king, and he's a priest on his throne. And being a priest on his throne, meaning he has a, a royal authority as well as priestly prerogatives as a minister of God's mercy and, and forgiveness and atonement, that made a whole different ball game. So the second we uh, take Christ and say he's no longer the second person of the Trinity, we lose all that. And so therefore, uh, we have nothing left but the power state to be the, the one to implement it. Therefore, Unitarianism uniformly becomes ultra-statist and puts all its hope in the state, in legislating and, and forcing conformity to their social goals of what the utopia should look like. And Unitarianism tends to be very utopian in outlook, and militantly so, and it seeks uh, its ethics from Christ in name only. But the reality is we don't have that. So there are a lot of things that happen once you toss out 
the second person of the Trinity and the third person of the Trinity by implication. Once you have thrown out uh, the Christ, then there's no reason to have anything but a raw monotheism. Then all relational uh, things that happen inside the Trinity are no longer important. Uh, they no longer have any place in theology or politics, you see. Uh, and therefore, you don't have that powerful balance that's laid out by the Council of Chalcedon, that in Christ there is no intermixture between the divine and the human nature. You know, he is the only bridge between the divine and the human, is uniquely so, and uh, no one else holds that slot. So therefore, this denies the divine right of kings. But the second you go down the Unitarian path, that barrier, that obstacle to divinizing a king is gone. And so by implication, Unitarianism always leads to power states, state, uh, the power state as the means to bring in the uh, utopia that they think Christ wanted us to bring in as an ethical teacher. So uh, that's the hazard. Uh, a lot of different Christian sects, uh, and, I, and I use the word Christian with quotation marks, have uh, attacked the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, and certainly the cults intrinsically do that too. So that's what happens. And that's why they have a half of a, a, a Bible. They keep the social part of it. Uh, and the uh, part that actually matters, which drives the social part properly from a knowledge of God's law and how he implements it through the writing of the law in the heart of man through regeneration, that's gone. They don't use regeneration as the means. They reform man using ethical instruction, and therefore education is a big key to the Unitarian solution. We need to remake man using humanistic techniques, and this will get us the society that Jesus talked about where people took care of the poor. As opposed to the Bible saying, you are to take care of the poor, or uh, and if you grind the face of the poor, I will punish you. So there's a covenantal relationship there that they deny. They don't think that God, uh, his means to resolve, say, question of poverty, other social problems, works. So they deny all that. At the same time, they deny that Christ is the, uh, the second person of the Trinity and the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is merely an ethical teacher, and therefore they have what is uh, called a Christless Christianity with his no atonement. And Warfield did a great job of exposing the uh, dark, seamy underside of Unitarianism in dealing with that. Because that popped in through the, uh, the German uh, school of thought in the, 18th, the 19th centuries particularly, where we had an attack on the veracity of Scripture, and boom, and then Christ, of course, took it on the chin. When the Scripture was attacked, they testified to Christ, and therefore, by pulling the rugs out from under Scripture, uh, we can now say we don't need the Christ. He's a fiction or figment imagination of these Christians. So, all right. And I will get to your question, Roberto, after I pull back and see what Bill said. Okay, Bill Evans. What importance must we place on liturgies of different sorts simpler, elaborate, in corporate worship. How much freedom do we have and or must we afford others? So uh, there's certainly uh, an interesting general principle, and it's only that. It's not necessarily a biblical principle, but they say when in Rome, do as the Romans do. In this, and, and Paul kind of did this in a sense. I uh, try to be uh, uh, all things to all men. So he may, uh, among Jewish believers, have done it a certain way and had a different approach in a... a uh, a Greek or Gentile audience, uh, so to be all things to all men. In other words, he wasn't bound by any, but he was willing to, but he had freedom to go and observe different things depending on where he was. So there's a biblical liberty, a Christian liberty there that is at the heart of what Paul was promoting. If there was a restraint on liberty, he would fight tooth and nail because that was an attack on what Christ set us free from. But insofar as it was voluntary and not enforced or coerced, he could be comfortable in a lot of different places. And we should learn how to do the same. Now, the second we say, you know, my form of Presbyterianism, say, or my form of uh, Congregationalism, or our liturgy, which uses instruments, or our liturgy that refuses to put an instrument anywhere near the church, uh, those are the right ways to go. Or the real purist, we keep, we hold church in catacombs. You guys are all nuts. So there's always some kind of scale where there's somebody who's better off or more pure than you are because they uh, are more ascetic and they're denying themselves, you know, the Bible doesn't say anything about air conditioning, so we got rid of the air conditioner in the church, which would be pretty insane in Texas, but it would certainly purge out the weak Christians, no, no doubt about that. So in terms of liturgy, uh, the liturgus, the work, the, the question is how structured should it be, and are those st structures intended to facilitate the worship of God in a way that is edifying, that feeds the flock, 
that nourishes the flock, that connects the flock to their Lord and the Lord to their flock, and the, co and the flock to one another. If all those things are present, a lot of the, um, I'm convinced that eventually we will have a common, a relatively uh, common lit liturgy some centuries from now that is not going to continue to go into extremes as it is today. We will finally determine once and for all, do the instruments belong or do they not belong? Where the, the, um, those who say they don't belong, that it should all be a cappella, exclusive psalmody, if they prevail, then ultimately, uh, and it's found to be found to be vehicle, we will see the instruments and the non-psalms stop being sung, ultimately. But if they're mistaken, though with the good intention, and intention is purity of worship, but if they're mistaken, then the reverse will be the case some centuries or millennia from now, because we're, I believe we're still in the era of the primitive church. In the meantime, there seems to be some encroachment on liberty of conscience, the binding of conscience in these matters, and also some misunderstanding. I am not aware of anyone who supports instruments in worship who holds that they're part of the mosaic system. Uh, they were set up uh, by David. It's the, da the, the tabernacle, tabernacle of David that had the instruments, not the mosaic situation per se, uh, though there were uh, certainly in the second First Chronicles 25.8, uh, I mentioned of the orders of worship. Those, were, again, were from Asaph and uh, the, the generals under um, David, that those were put into place. And so they're not sp specifically mosaic. So that when you say when the mosaic law is uh, shut down, the ceremonial part, and the instruments die with it, is a mistake because, uh, from what I can tell, uh, that's, there's no point where the, temp the tabernacle of David is to be set aside. See what I'm saying? In fact, in Acts 15... The incoming of the accession of the Gentiles is said to be a fulfillment of this prophecy from Amos 9, uh, 11, concerning the uh, raising again of the tabernacle of David, which was distinctive in the fact that they had musical instruments and musicians to it. So there's more to be said, and there seems to be some talking past each other. One group saying, you've got to get rid of that mosaic ceremonial stuff. Another group saying, but it wasn't mosaic, it's Davidic. So until they get start to talk toe-to-toe, -to -toe, we're not going to resolve those questions. And so, therefore, to bind consciences in the meantime, before I think we've resolved these questions properly, uh, versus voting with our feet, which tends to be the Christian pattern, uh, it's, uh, I understand conviction. Convictions are so important because you know, if you don't have convictions, you don't have Christianity. But often we will find ourselves, our convictions tied to things that uh, will end up changing because we also say semper reformanda, but we're always reforming. Well, that's the case. The convictions are subject to revision because they may not be as biblical as we think they are today, but they may be. Yeah. And the last thing you want to do is be, the right, be in the right place today and be convinced away from it. So you hold on to your conviction until proven positive that it's the wrong way. In the meantime, we should uh, acknowledge everyone else's willingness to, that they're not, not trying to be a tax scripture, but their understanding of it allows them to have a different understanding uh, or a different approach to these things. And so we should acknowledge that they are trying to worship God and honor him the way that they see best, even if we differ with them on that. So it goes two ways. One, I'd like to have some liberty, but don't be a hypocrite and say, and, and now that I've got it, I want to deprive you of yours. That won't work. In fact, that's hypocrit hypocritical in the, in the most extreme sense. I see there's a pinned or something coming up, but let me take these in sequence. Josh Wall says, from Elgin, okay, uh, Oklahoma. I assume you pronounce it Elgin like we do here in the city of Elgin, Texas. If not, you can correct me. I was reading Ezekiel 14 and was wondering what verse 14 and verse 20 are explaining how the Lord does not just transfer guilt, but even righteousness to an extent. Can you explain how this right, uh, relates to current culture and issues of abortion and sex trafficking and the like? If we repent as Christians, we'll, and there's more to the question, but I can't see it. But let, like, let me see what, what the passage says. And uh, grab it. Ezekiel 14, 14 and 14, 20. Well, these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it. They should deliver, but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. So this has to do with this. this land sinneth grievously against me by trespassing. Then will I stretch my hand out upon it. And I'll break the staff of the bread thereof, and will send famine upon it, and will cut off man and beast from it. This is even though we had righteous guys like Noah, Daniel, and Job in it, they would only deliver their own souls. The rest of the land would still go through. In verse 20, 
Or if I send a pestilence into the land and pour out my fury upon it in blood to cut off from it man and beast, though Noah, Daniel, and Job are in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, they shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. So, uh, and by the way, when we say, as I live, saith the Lord God, as I live is an oath. It's an oath that says, may I be set aside as a worthless idol if I don't do this. It is it's, it's a self-maledictory oath. God uh, saying, may I be dead if I don't do this. So it's the ultimate oath when God says it. So he means business. He's basically saying that there is actually no uh, transfer. Remember, in the discussion we had in Genesis, when God goes back and forth with Abraham, and Abraham says, perchance there was 20 righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah. Would you spare the city? For the sake of 20, I would. Now notice here how many are mentioned that are righteous, just three. So we're not even coming to up to the threshold. So I don't think it's a contradiction uh, when God's discussing this through Ezekiel the prophet uh, and the sins of uh, Israel and uh, Judah here uh, versus what God informs Abraham of. And of course, we did in fact move Lot and his family out away from Sodom before it was destroyed, Sodom and Gomorrah. So the same thing would happen here. Uh, so the notion is that, you know, if we have a few good guys here, that's enough to hold the place together. Maybe yes, maybe no. Yeah, you are presuming on something, and the scripture even goes so far as to say even their children wouldn't necessarily be spared. Everyone is going to stand on their own righteousness and not be transmitted. There's a passage, I believe, uh, it's in uh, Haggai or Habakkuk, I have to look, third chapter where the discussion is uh, what's transmittable, uh, uncleanness or cleanness? And uh, they said, yes, in fact, if um, an unclean thing is put into a clean, like the skirt of a priest, it pollutes it and defiles it. But if you put a clean thing in, it doesn't clean it, in other words. So uh, the thing that's contagious is sin. It spreads very quickly. Defilement. It's not uh, it's sin that's got this pervasiveness. And righteousness does not transmit to other people. But sin can, in fact, infect beyond its current borders. So that's the lesson there. Uh, if we repent, it has to be honest, true repentance. Remember, uh, Jonah was quite torn about and did not want to go to Nineveh because he said God may forgive them. He said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown, but it wasn't the case because they repented and God being true to his word, if he were to destroy the city when it had been repented, then he would have been an unjust God. Uh, had they stayed the course, then he would, of course, destroyed them. But the, from the king down, they went into sackcloth and ashes and repented of their sins before. And a greater than uh, Nineveh you know, is happening here in the New Testament. Jesus draws attention to those, you know, Nineveh repented, but you guys don't. Uh, and there's someone greater than a Jonah here. So, all that to say, uh, it depends on where you stand as a nation. Now, can a nation repent? Yes, nations have repented in the past, and Nineveh is a fantastic example. And Nineveh did it in record time, but they realized that they were uh, on thin ice with God, as Jonah made clear to them in his ministrations among them. Let's see. Good afternoon. Okay, Roberto Corral, Jr., doesn't this all really stem from cleaving to an Arminian faith which centers around the will of man in all things, Martin Sobretti? I think you're referring to the torture question, possibly. Uh, if you are, then the answer is yes. In the introduction to the Great Christian Revolution, I ran, uh, wrote the preface to the book or the introduction to it, and I pointed out that what Rushduni and Otto Scott were saying is that it was the Calvinists that promoted parliamentary rule and it was the Arminians that supported the king. Because for the Arminians, they felt that there was God was not directly ruling over the affairs of men. And that meant that God only ruled in the person of the king. So therefore, you had to be 100% submitted to the king because he is, in effect, God, because God himself is absentee landlord, in effect, more of a deistic approach. And that's why the Arminians always supported the king. And the Calvinists always supported liberty and freedom through parliament or other structures that were decentralized and not prone to having an apex predator at the top, as the king tended to be back then. And to this day, I still believe that's the case. There's a reason why in Psalm 76, the kingdoms are called mountains of prey, that is, mountains that attack other mountains. Each mountain represents a kingdom, and when one mountain attacks another, they're called predatory mountains. And this is actually how they, they play out in histories in a predatory way. 
But yet, yeah, Arminianism does, in fact, uh, give far too many points away and resides ultimate authority in man and therefore in the state. And therefore, the connection between statism and Arminianism is made very clear in the book, The Great Christian Revolution. That's one of the most powerful points of the book. Uh, and those who are not familiar with it should consider acquiring a copy. All right, Simone, watching. Glad to have you with us, Simone. Okay, Zachary. Can horror be used for the glory of God? Well, it often isn't used to the glory of God. I think so. The scripture does get into some pretty gory details of violence. I also have some resources I could recommend. I think that anything can be used to God's glory under the proper circumstances. Um, the things that... Uh, for example, why would Balaam's ass be used to God's glory? But it was. It was just a donkey, mule, or whatever the thing was, bureau. Uh, but it certainly protested and verbalized its objection to being driven into the angel's sword that's standing athwart to their path. So you know, any, God can use anything that he wants. Now, does that mean that we should go out of our way to test God's patience with us? No. It probably means that we should exhibit some sanctified wisdom in approaching these things. But if we want to reach a certain community, and that community uh, subculture uh, can only be approached a certain way, uh, then you're going to need to f figure out how to reach them. If you're just going to say you guys need to repent of that lifestyle, and that's the, the soul from uh, Alpha and Omega of my message to you, you will not reach them. Someone else might say, I'm going to go into this community and understand what their needs are and what makes them tick and I will gain their trust, and then when I bring the Word of God to them, they'll respond. And I've seen this over and over again in very controversial cases where people said, well, you should not have gone into that community and been part of them. But you know, those individuals who did ended up bringing much fruit. I mean, uh, lives changed, converted, conversions, people becoming reconstructionists out of that, who can, and very profound ones. So we can't simply say in advance that a certain community is is by definition, cut off and unreasonable except on my terms. That is to limit the Holy One of Israel, and that's something we are not to do. Uh, I just commented on this verse in a Chalcedon Report, our essay that we sent off for publication uh, just last week. Uh, we do not limit the Holy One of Israel. We're subject to limitations, but God is not. So God can use things that we might not think. Uh, but in these cases, it's because someone has a heart for that community and says, you know, those folks out there, they need someone to reach them. And if no one else is going to go, God send me. And Paul had the same approach. He said, I would rather be cursed if I could see Israel saved. So if someone has that kind of heart for a subculture that might, uh, on the face of it, look very, very mm, defiled or non anti Christian um, and, and rebellious, it might be that that person can reach them, even though you might not. You might simply turn, put, you know, hold your nose and say, Well, who would bother? They're, they're lost. The other person might say, they're, because they're lost, I'm going to go after them. And who's the better evangelist in that case? The person who reached them and brought them to Christ. Uh, because they were elect there lurking that needed to be reached. So I think it's powerful. So is it possible for horror to be used? Yes. Do I recommend it? I don't know uh, yeah, uh, if it... I don't want to have a pragmatic approach saying that you saved three people showing them this horror film. Some people thought The Passion of the Christ was a horror film because it was so visceral in terms of the uh, flogging in particular and the crucifixion. Um, it was called snuff porn, for example, by at least one or more film critics who didn't like that this is what happened to Jesus Christ. Well, no one was supposed to like a crucifixion or a flogging, and this simply brought it front and center, and no one liked it. It offended them uh, because they were no longer able to be comfortable in Zion having viewed it. God might be able to use these things. For us to say, no, he can't, is to limit God, and that's a problem. But we also need to walk within the parameters that we know. Uh, and so whatever is pure, whatever is good, these things are we used to dwell on. And so from one point of view, horror doesn't satisfy that list that's laid out in Philippians. Uh, but that said, it's possible that God can use it. You know, we, we were just discussing on a thread in the Facebook area, I think it's uh, 2 Corinthians 5.11, the proper translation of that text. And King James treats it, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Whereas other translations, modern ones say, Knowing therefore the fear of the Lord, rather than terror of the Lord. Now the word is phobon there, uh, phobon to kirion, but uh, the, um, or this, I think that's right, and the, uh, the, the sense of it is terror is something that's 
kind of has a, has a sense of horror because it's just, it's a, uh, a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God kind of terror. And so that's what's used as an evangelical tool. You, you confront the Gentiles, for example, with the doctrine of the final judgment. That gets somewhere with them. You might have a different approach with a Jewish believer. He would appeal, say, to the prophecies of the Old Testament and the fulfillment in Christ as Paul walked through things, as Jesus walked through things with the disciples on the way to Emmaus. Same thing. Uh, RJR writes about what you said in the paper word in a season titled Contagion. Yes, that's correct. It's a great one. And he uses that text uh, from one of those two smaller prophets uh, concerning holding the, uh, the defiled meat in the, in the skirt and getting it contaminated. Correct. And it's a matter of which, which direction does it more easily contaminate. Kim, welcome. I know you, uh, Stephen had his birthday just recently, didn't he? I feel like Hobo Killy sometimes the way I talk. Okay, Ground Control has a good comment. Uh, let me hit the Seymour button on that. After a few decades of the religious rights, most moral battles were lost on the political and social fronts, abortion, gay marriage, genderism. Where do we see Christian political involvement at this time? Well, if we're not going to use God's law as our pivot point, we've already conceded that we're going to use humanistic weapons. We're going to be fighting in Saul's armor. So, this, so as long as Christians insist on grabbing Saul's armor and f using those tools, they're not going to get anywhere. They're not going to be able to move in terms of the categories that God has laid out for us. Again, it's regeneration that's the mechanism, not revolution. So we need to start at the very grassroots. If you, uh, it's like one article or a book, book that we once said, we had to create a new kind of Christian. I think Andrew Sandlin uh, titled one of his pamphlets or monographs that total, and it's correct. And with a, because if a Christian is simply um, a baptized statist, we're going to continue on the statist route. There'll be no change because everyone is going to go along the same path. But uh, and this ties into a question that was raised last week. Someone asked, uh, "What kind of resources would you speak to in terms of qualifications for the civil magistrate?" And I gave several. But I missed one that I normally cover because I didn't directly ask the question about voting. Here's a case in point. And there's a passage in Second uh, Samuel 23, verse 2, 3, 4, where God is speaking to David. And uh, let me get the exact passage in the King James because it's worthwhile seeing how it lays out because God repeats himself in it. When God repeats himself, uh, it's, we should pay attention because he's not normally going to do that. Second Samuel 23. Here it is, verse 2 through 4. 2 and 3 is actually more adequate. The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spake to me, he that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. There it is in a nutshell. That's the entire requirement for a civil magistrate. He who rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. This one thing would revolutionize everything related to the political and social fronts. Period. Uh, and we don't observe this, we consider this optional, where God says it must be. He who rules over men must be just, which means he rules according to God's law, and he uh, rules in the fear of God, meaning he's not someone who fears the word of man. He's not prone to bribery. He won't act to be to get reelected, for example. That won't be his motive at all. His motive will be to observe the law of God and not worry about re-election, as opposed to the opposite situation today. So when this becomes the rule... Uh, that happens in the voting booth as well as any other category. And only men who, and, and this deals with our pragmatic loss of faith. Men, in terms of pra pragmatic um, considerations, expedience, will say, well, we, maybe next generation they can do that, or the, uh, uh, maybe a couple of elections from now. But right now we have to deal with what we have in front of us. And you know something? That's said every single time. Every single election has got the exact same pretext for putting in the exact same status and ignoring what God says must happen. So as, long, and as Christians are at fault, because this is in your scripture, it's in your Bible, it's in my Bible, and therefore if we are voting people in who are not just, who are not ruling in the fear of God, that's on us. And then we get the leadership we deserve, as Dr. Rushdoney said. And then God's going to bypass our generation, and we're going to be the generation that wanders in the wilderness for 40 years until our great-grandchildren great decide, you know, our, our ancestors were nuts. They kept putting in status. Expedience is a dangerous thing. This is exactly why Christ was crucified. When Caiaphas says, you understand nothing, 
Do you not know that it's expedient that one man should die rather than the whole nation perish? So this, they justified killing their own Messiah. So expedience can get you all sorts of excuses, including murdering your own Messiah. So why go down that path? A little idealism couldn't hurt, right, if it's based on Scripture. See, the Scripture is not idealistic. It's very realistic. It's saying, if you don't do this, God's going to come act upon you. Uh, they've made void thy law, O Lord. Therefore, it's time for thee to work. I actually reversed the clause. It's time for thee to work, O Lord, because they've made void thy law. Psalm 119, verse 126. Do you want to risk that? I don't. So the last thing you need to be doing is going to the voting booth and saying, oh, lesser two, two evils. That's worked for us so far, hasn't it? No, it hasn't. It's been a disaster. And it continues to be a disaster. And America continues to walk into uh, the wide space that leads to destruction with the notion that it's doing the right thing because it uh, avoided a, a greater evil. So Christian political involvement should be by bringing the Word of God to bear at the grassroots. Um, like people like... Um, prince or like priest, that we think the phrase is um, from the scriptures, and that's the way Hosea says this. And so if you have an unjust population, it's not going to work. For example, top-down righteousness failed for Israel, it failed because Josiah was the best king they ever had, and it took only two kings past that to be Zedekiah, his blinded eyes poked out, and they led them all off to Babylon. So they, though they had a great revival, under Josiah, it was skin deep because the people just saw him as a popular guy. Uh, they loved him. He was like the Reagan of the era, except he's very young, kind of like Reagan. Uh, and so he was a well beloved young king, but their love was shallow because it wasn't a love for God. It were the things of God. They just thought he was a great king and he looked, he looked like he was serious about his business, but it only went so far as the king and his house, and it didn't extend to his sons or his grandsons. And therefore, they were just a step away from disaster. So they had this respite, but the respite didn't last because, again, the revival was skin deep. So unless you start at the grassroots, you're not going to have uh, any benefit by thinking, all we got to do is put the right president at the top. That's the wrong kind of thinking. You need the right kind of people at the bottom for them to be anything even worth uh, something at the top. And that kind of, and we should also restore all these power balances, too, while we're at it. But that's a different story. It has to do with uh, the Constitution and whatnot. We're not going to get into that fight today. Thank you, Zachary. That's a good I mean, Thank you for posting that. Does artistic purity ever demand vulgarity? So we have an interesting view there. Why the church needs more ugly art? Well, of course, uh, one thing we don't need is uh, more, what's the word, pietism. While we're on the topic of pietism, which um, is not the same thing as piousness, to be pious is not the same thing as pietistic. Pietistic means that this end all and be all. I want you to talk again about Bach. One of my favorite talking points is Bach, his biographer, Philip Spitta, analyzed his music, and he had some of the beautiful music of the time. Also some really profound and powerful and dissonant music, for that matter. But they said, how is it that this guy was not a pietist? Because the pietists in Germany were known for their sense of aesthetics and beauty in art. But Bach was a orthodox guy. His, he actually, uh, um, in order to become the cantor, he had to answer questions in Latin, theological questions in Latin, to satisfy the uh, requirements for the position of the post. And he answered them well and passed the test. You know, he makes us look like stupid morons, and he's just a musician trying to get a post as a cantor the Cantorai, uh, at one of the churches there in the area. And, of course, the lessons were conducted in Latin. So not only did he know German and Italian for his music, but he had to understand Latin enough to answer tough technical questions. Uh, and so he was an Orthodox guy. He had this um, dusty old theology books on his shelf, and he created works of art that stand the test of time. So you don't need the pietists and, and their notion of mushy-gushy, pious gush uh, to get somewhere that lasts and that people can say there was the greatest musician who ever lived, potentially. He's in competition, obviously, with, with Beethoven, perhaps. But uh, in my view, it's, an, it's a non-starter. The prophetic role of the church in our time. Of course, the church, by being prophetic, is to pronounce the word of God into the situation, is to enunciate God's will. Um, I spoke about this last week. You know, the people seek uh, God's wisdom, the word of God, at the lip of the priest, at the lip of the Levite. And so instead of offering what God says, the church tells people what it feels and thinks. 
and this is the catastrophe of our era, is that we have detached the church from the Word of God. But we're told, was in Titus, you know, the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. So the only reason it exists is so that it would be exactly that, and the truth is found only in the Word of God. So its mission is to propagate the Word of God because it's the Word of God that sanctifies, it consecrates, uh, and that directs us and guides our step, and it's a light unto our feet. So when the church snaps off that light and decides to just tell people what it feels or what it thinks, as opposed to what God requires, then it has lost all moral authority because it's just one other voice among many versus being God's voice in the midst. Uh, I find a kind of hilarious scene in the movie The Ten Commandments from 1956. Moses and Aaron are in line to speak with Pharaoh. And one of the guards stops him and says, well, what, what kingdom do you represent? And Moses says, kingdom of the Most High. And the church has lost that vision entirely. Uh, we just wanted one other, one other social interest group at this point. And that simply means uh, we have thrown away our birthright. We sold it for relevance, social relevance. So you had a choice between God's word or social relevance. Now, if you stuck with God's word, you would have become socially relevant because God's word makes it so. But by choosing social relevance, you lose both because now you're just another uh, player in the game. Thank you, Charles Roberts. Yeah, the church is the pillar and support or ground of the truth. The church is to inform the magistrate of his obligations before the king of kings. By the way, that can be a, uh, a scary thing. Uh, but there's uh, a phrase used in Proverbs which I'm always struck by. You see a man who's diligent in his labors, he shall stand before kings. What a profound statement. Now, if Christians are lax in their labors, if they're the ones who um, are into vacationville and <laughs> and they're not working with their hands with all their might, as Ecclesiastes. But silver hand, your hand findeth it to do, do it with all your might. So if we're in that ball game and we're diligent in our labors, then God lifts us up and puts us in interesting places like toe-to-toe -to -toe with the king. But if we are mediocre in our labors and uh, shabby in our faith and we have a hunger-bitten faith, like corn husks, nothing in it that's nutritious, then what do we have to offer to the world? So until you sink in and get the word for yourself so that you can propagate it to others, you're going to be in a bad shape. You're not going to be able to be that broadcast beacon, uh, that light in the darkness. And the light of the God's word is crucial. That's why we always point back, I think almost every single Q&A we quoted from Isaiah 820, to the law and the testimony, they speak not according to these, it's because there's no light in them. So your mission is to send light into the world, and that means you're going to be quoting from the law and the testimony. That means you're going to bring God's word to bear on a situation as opposed to man's word. And you're going to counter man's word. You're going to confront man's word. Nothing comfortable about it. There's some courage involved in it. That's fine. God will give you the courage and the wisdom to know when to move forward and when to refrain. It's a time to speak, time to be silent. Um, and sometimes if the situation is so far gone, then you prepare for judgment. We see this judgment situation laid out in the final section of the third chapter of Malachi 3, I think it's from verse 15 to 18, about um, that we had a situation that we talked about last week where all the foundations were destroyed. Uh, Psalm 11, verse 3 situation. It says, so all the righteous, he said, they spoke to one another quietly about these things. And it says, and it was taken as jewels. They were jewels in God's thing. And he wrote up this as a book of remembrance, the Lord did, about the fact that their conversations and their discussions, which mutually reinforced their um, remnant, if you will, in the midst of a crisis, uh, and and strengthen them in that. There was something to be said for that, even in a bad time, when things have gone bad. And we don't have that excuse to this day, because our time is not that bad uh, in terms of personal prosperity. Now, in terms of societal mass murder, that's a different story. Uh, and that's why I think the anti-abortion movement, the abolitionist movement with abortion, has a lot to say in terms of uh, being very, very forthright, perhaps uncomfortably so, but what's comfortable about being aborted? So. At that point, when we're saying we need to play nice-nice with murderers, I'm not that convinced that that's the right approach. Uh, certainly not if it hasn't worked since 1973. All right, Charles Roberts. Hosea accused the Israelites of kissing calves. Kiss the donkey and the elephant. <laughs> well, that's a profound accusation. Let's not have that be said of us. But, you know, there, there's a, some truth in that because the praise of men is something that we tend to covet. All covetousness is bad, but to covet the praise of men is probably the worst because uh, and that's, the most, that's the quickest path to compromise. It's the quickest path to spiritual uh, um, starvation. 
and God's word will not pass your lips anymore. You're simply going to want to be a man pleaser. And that also entails fear of men because you're going to want that. You fear loss of their um, praise uh, and therefore you, you stay low and you keep your mouth shut and you accept the praises of men because you enjoy them. In fact, interestingly enough, one of the things that uh, marked those who did not want to uphold Christ in the synagogues is two things. They, they uh, uh, said, of course, that they feared being cast out of the synagogues, but it also says that they loved the, the um, um, praises of man. So both things are a snare to us, the praise of men in particular. And so when you're kissing the, uh, the calf or the kissing the donkey and the elephant, I'm not sure what symbol we'll ever have for a third-party candidate, uh, if any, except that if you're going to be one, you better know where Aleppo is. Uh, what a disaster that was. So upshot is, yes, we are our leaders, where are they leading us? If they don't know the Word of God, certainly they're leading us into a ditch. And, and there's there can no other way. You know, it would merely be accidental that they happen to follow along a, a biblical policy, say, uh, financial, fiscal, something as simple as honest money. We're not getting it, we're not going to have it, uh, we're not demanding it, and we're not putting alternatives out yet that are significant. Now, once they become significant, what will happen is the people who put them out might get pushback from the state. The person who developed the Liberty Dollar here in Texas, he ended up in jail. Apparently, uh, they, they got him on some kind of technicality, and they know how to find the technicality by which they can shut down an operation to have a competing currency in the missing United States of America. And this is exactly what happened with the Liberty Dollar here in Texas. Uh, whether the person was right or wrong or guilty of the things is not to the point. The point is we seem to be able to put our foot in our mouth no matter what we do and we um, go out half-cocked. So with much counsel, war is waged, the Bible informs us. If we, are in, if we think this is a quick and dirty, we can solve this problem and God's going to give us a quick deliverance, I don't think so. I think it's going to, it took us years to dig this hole, this deep that we're in. And you to dig yourself out is harder. And in case in point, I always say this when I talk about education. In order to do what God requires for education, you need to pull your kid out of the public school. Now, guess what? You're going to be now be paying for the education in the public school you're not using and for the education you are delivering, either through homeschooling or a private Christian school. So you're paying twice. To dig yourself out of that hole, you now have to pay twice as much. And for many Christians, that they're not willing to do even for their own children. So we will, if you are willing to sell your children down the pike, then it's no wonder that we have abortion on the level that we have in the secular community. And no wonder that torture is the dominant theme uh, in how we deal with other nations and with alleged terrorists and things like that. So, uh, all that to say, it's a slippery slope. Once we have abandoned God, then you are dealing with man. King David had a very significant thing to say when given a choice between falling into the hands of men or falling into the hands of God uh, as a consequence of his sin rely, uh, relating to Uriah the Hittite. And David said, let me not fall into the hands of men. He'd rather have God condemn him than men condemn him. He was right, and our attitude is the opposite. We'd rather that God condemn us and men be happy with us. And how do I know it? Because in every single opportunity we have a choice, we choose to please men and not God. Very rare do we see the opposite. And only those who observe the whole counsel of God even consider taking that step because it involves moral courage, and that is at a premium today. It's very hard to find. But if you stand on the Word of God unconditionally, on your faith, as the Western you said, even a minority can dominate a nation because God will use them. God is going to work through these people. And then we're going to have that situation that Western talks about in when he discusses uh, the early chapters of Zechariah. For every oppressor, there is a deliverer. In that example, they were the, the four horns that are attacking Israel and, and, and grieving them. But God raises up four blacksmiths, tectons, we mentioned it, uh, to fray the horns. And there's just as many uh, uh, blacksmiths as there are horns. For every oppressor, God sends a deliverer. But that's for the people that God, you know, who call out to God, who genuinely, not hypocritically, but genuinely are calling out to God and are willing to have learned their lesson, we're going to do it God's way. Because if you keep going back like a dog to the vomit, 
you can have nothing but a vomit diet. And Christians routinely do that today. Homeschooling a private Christian school will cost you money. Pagan school will cost you your children. That puts it as clearly as anyone can say it, Graham. Uh, and I appreciate that that uh, is the case. I think we have all the questions answered that are pending. I'll ask ground control if there's any others. And if not, we might end up closing early uh, on Memorial Day weekend. I'm surprised we didn't get any questions about Memorial Day. I'm not sure I would have had any good answers about it, but this question arises a lot. You know, do all the men who gave their lives for the nation, do they deserve uh, a day to themselves uh, where we commemorate their, their service? And a lot depends on, oh, time is up. I love ground control. They're good people. <laughs> Whoever's at ground controls, controls today, they're doing a great job. I know who it is. All right, yes, and we have this upcoming Book of the Month Club that we mentioned. Uh, you definitely want to get in touch with that. Uh, sign up if you haven't. There's a link, and uh, very powerful. If you happen to miss it, they usually are up on the website within a week after broadcast, live broadcast. So you can certainly uh, hear what happened, though you can't obviously participate and interject and ask a question or make a comment. That only happens when you're live. But they are very, very worthwhile. I very much enjoyed uh, the last one, which is on the Calcine website, where... Uh, Tim Yarbrough discussed Chariots of Prophetic Fire, a very, very powerful book. And he brought to bear a lot of interesting personal applications in the state of Alabama, where he saw certain things that were playing out, indicative that we live in a syncretistic era. Roberto, have a good day. Have a great weekend for all of those who are able to take a three-day weekend off. And we will see you all next week. God bless each and every one of you. Be brave and courageous in the Lord. Apply the Word of God. And remember, he who rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. Accept no substitutes.